Again, I'm Michael Doherty, and I'm the, the director for the festival. And the whole purpose of what we want to do right now, we're calling it a schmooze Zoom. And it's not going to be the same thing where I'm just talking to Rachel and she's talking to me. We wanted to invite everybody to sort of tune in with their mics and their cameras and to actually have a conversation. And if anybody has questions about filmmaking, uh, about Rachel's career, um, and how she's been making her way um, as a physically challenged artist um, in the world, uh, we want to do that. We're gonna, we can just throw the ball around casually for, for a half hour or so. So if anybody awesome. has any questions right off the bat, um, just jump right in. You don't need me. And we have changed the room settings, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your video feed uh, if you'd like to go ahead and, and jump in and participate. Thanks, everyone. Rachel, how did you get started in um, film and acting? Was it after your accident or before? Um, you know what? I, I've always loved singing and musicals, so... Uh, growing up, I did like community theater, and I always did my high school plays and musicals, and I was in band, and I did all of that stuff. Uh, so I ended up going to college for musical theater, um, and I performed at like some regional theaters. I loved um, performing at Bucks County Playhouse. That's probably my favorite favorite spot because it's right on the water, and it's such a beautiful town. And I. Um, I played Marion in The Music Man, and like I got to be in all these classic musicals. Um, so I really loved doing musicals, and so I moved to New York City to be on Broadway. You know, that was the goal. <laughs> um, and I was starting to, you know, get more and more auditions, more and more callbacks, and I was actually driving to an audition um, at the time when I lost my leg. So I lost my leg on the way to an audition and in the hospital while I was recovering, I was getting calls from theaters like for callbacks and for auditions. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't go. I'm, I like just lost my leg. I don't know what my life is going to look like. I don't know if I'll still be able to do this. Um, that sounds like was, a movie right yeah. there. <laughs> I, I know, it. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I am starting to write a like Christmas holiday movie that's a little bit based on my life, but not quite. So that's that's in the works. But um, but yeah. So after I lost my leg, I I decided that I wanted to keep auditioning for musicals. And I moved back to New York um, once I was able to start walking again. Because um, New York City is a very hard city to live in if you're on crutches or use a wheelchair. Um, most of the subway stations are not accessible. So I waited to move back until I could walk better, um, especially because I lived in Queens in Astoria where you have to walk up like three flights of stairs to get to the subway. So um, it was not an accessible area, but it was cheap enough for me to move back to. So I got back and I remember my first musical theater audition after I lost my leg. I sang a song for the casting directors and they, they told me, oh, it's beautiful, you sound great. We'd like to call you back, but it's a dance callback. So, <laughs> and they all laughed. And I just left the room. I didn't know how to react to that. Um, I was shocked and I, I kind of, I took it personally yeah. and I stopped auditioning for musicals. Um, and I mean, now you see, t uh, Tony winner Ali Stroker on the Broadway stage in a wheelchair and it's like yes <laughs> but man um eight years ago I got laughed out of a room because of my prosthetic leg so it was really it was painful um and that's when I switched to tv and film work I actually got cast in a 
a horror movie called Smothered just a year after I lost my leg. And it's still today one of my favorite roles I've ever played because um, I was the love interest of the leading character. He had some burn scars on his face and I had my blade leg. So our physical differences sort of drew us together in the script. Um, so doing that film made me want to, you know, keep writing my own films and um, act more in like TV and, and film. So that's the long answer. <laughs> oh, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Um, I don't want to miss any other questions. So if other questions get, you know, if someone's raising their hand, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or I'll try to keep an eye out if someone has their, their hand raised. But I can talk all day, so I don't want to go too talk too much about one thing if there are other questions out there. <laughs> hey, hey, Rachel, Stephen Simon again. I'm, I'm with the Department on Disability here in LA and, and we're, we host the Real Ability Film Festival in LA and thrilled to have you with us. Um, you said some magic words when you were talking with Michael after the Easter Seals panel um, around the direct advocacy work that film can do, right? The messaging, but you, you made a point of, you know, let's get these in the hands of mayors and governors. So I'll start by simply saying, we in LA absolutely promise to help you do that. One, not only here in LA, but we meet with our, um, our departments of disabilities and mayor's office of disabilities across the nation. And we will gladly try and make sure your film gets in their hands because they need to understand um, the issues that you portray there. So my question for, for this discussion is, you know, do you plan on really investing and spending a lot of time in the in the direct advocacy world. So I separate that from the filmmaking itself, but are you going to go, you know, testify at city councils, go testify in Washington at Congress because the cost, the valuation of human lives, particularly disabled human lives is really problematic and really is the core of our movement. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, filmmaking is a great avenue to spread awareness and make change. Um, and then also, I do want to keep um, advocating in a more specific way, like my film did, um, my documentary, because I've, I've always been um, more of a creative person, an artist, and less, um, less directly involved in, um, you know, politics and, and uh, social justice issues. I've, I've sort of addressed that in my work rather than like more directly. Um, so I think, of course, I, I want to, you know, keep acting and keep writing stories and, and spreading awareness through, um, through my, my work um, in, in narrative short films and, and the pilot that I'm writing and, and maybe this, you know, Christmas movie that I'm writing. Um, because I'm always, always going to cast actors with disabilities. I'm always going to cast authentically. And I'm always going to write stories about disability, um, or at least that include it in some way. Um, so that's like the big thing that I definitely, it's my life's passion, it's my life's work. Um, but after making this documentary that's, you know, specifically about health insurance and my own struggles as a disabled woman in this country, I do want to keep, um, keep doing that work. And I, I am, you know, going to be uh, sending this out to different um, government officials, especially locally since they already know me a bit um and i'm you know on the board for art house productions in jersey city making sure theater content is more accessible and i have many friends in the area who um are directly related with the government and and work to make sure all of the events are accessible um but when it comes to health insurance i i definitely want to keep speaking with the amputee coalition because I mean, they've been so good to me, and I volunteer with them for um, camps for kids who are amputees um, because they, you know, they need a space where they can just feel like themselves. So being part of that camp is really 
really special to me. Um, but when it comes to politics and policies that, you know, are affecting our lives in a very um, real and very um, <laughs> just, uh, just very specific and important way, I think that I want to, I want to keep doing this work and I'm not sure how yet, um, besides just, you know, writing to my local legislators, making films like this, but it's something I want to keep doing because I think, um, especially right now, uh, raising our, our voices and making a ruckus and fighting for change and, and more inclusion and equality um, is more important than ever. So I definitely want to keep, keep doing that. Um, but my passion and my life, my life force is uh, acting and making narrative films. Um, but you know, as things progress in our country and in the world, we'll see what happens. It might, it might be more documentaries for me. So you never know. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question. <laughs> um, let's see. I thought I saw a hand raised. Was oh, that, that might have been me. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk to us, by the way. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I am a Canadian actor and drama teacher, but I focus mainly on students with um, disabilities. And I actually worked with the Miracle Project in LA. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it. Uh, back in 2018, and a general goal of mine would be to eventually bring that to Canada because we surprisingly don't have a lot of programs and options like that here, which is kind of what motivated me to look into it a bit more. Um, and I guess my question is, I'm sorry if you already have answered it, but so what do you find the biggest misrepresentation is with um, when it comes to films or shows with people who struggle with living day to day with disabilities, I get asked that a lot. Um, and I know it depends on person, but is it, I don't know, like what, what, what would you say the biggest one might be? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question because um, I think we get a lot wrong when it comes to disability representation in the media. So I would have to say that um, the biggest misconception is that people with disabilities uh, aren't capable of being a lead role or even a supporting role in films and movies and television because they keep casting people without disabilities in leading roles um, like Brian Cranston in The Upside um, and every movie makes the excuse of oh, well, we can't um, cast a no-name actor who uses a wheelchair because we need to make money. And I'm so tired of that excuse because really, like, you've got Kevin Hart and Nicole Kidman in the movie. Like, you're, you're, people are going to see it, you know? And what it would do for the disability community um, is just so much more it outweighs, like, any amount of money to me but you know with movie studios it's like you're you're probably still going to get your money back even if you cast an unknown in that role because you've got so many other star names um so i think it's um actually very damaging to cast inauthentically because it sends the message that there's no one in the world who uses a wheelchair who can play this role and that's so untrue um so I think, and, and that's in front of the screen, but also behind the screen, there's a lot of discrimination against people with disabilities thinking they can't, um, they can't handle being in a writer's room because it's, you know, too much stress. And, and there's, um, there's just so many excuses about hiring people with disabilities. But the truth is that, you know, people with disabilities are the best at adapting. So, 
even if we can't do something the same way that someone else does it, we can still do it. We just find our own way to do it. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, that was such a good question. I think in general, it's, it's just um, not casting authentically, not hiring authentically and diversely. It, it just works to such a detriment to the film and TV industry. Um, and they're missing out on so many amazing, creative, original stories. Like, I don't need to see another, <laughs> I don't know, I don't need to see another comedy about um, a single parent, uh, a, a white male single parent. I want to see something different. Um, and I think, like, some of these medical dramas are starting to cast more diversely, which is really nice to see. And the storylines are becoming very complex and interesting. Like, New Amsterdam always casts authentically when they write a disability-specific role. And um, I think that show is really benefiting from doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I guess, I mean, I could talk about different TV shows all day, but that's... Uh, that's my answer sort of in a nutshell. Thank you. Does that help at all? Yeah. It did a lot. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for that question. That really made me think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that Stephanie? It's Chris. I'm sharing the screen. With oh, it's Chris. Simon. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, yeah, we're sharing the Zoom screen. I just want to say how much I appreciated your film. And also, um, Jennifer, um, I both of the all of these shorts were so great and I wanted to just uh, talk about I mean just you, the theme of access to health care and um, I thought it was really powerful um, with the um, the juxtaposition of access to US health care versus the one woman who was in Norway and just like this is no big deal you're just going to get your stuff right everything that you need and so um, I just wanted to maybe hear you talk a little bit more uh, about some of that. I, I actually teach medical anthropology um, to university students. And I think all of these shorts that we're seeing, these Easter Seal shorts are so, would, are so great for um, the undergraduate classroom to just demonstrate, you know, kind of the power of these politics. And just given the political situation that we're in right now, where the ACA for you know, it's got its limitations, but um, it's still something that's there is really in threat of going away. So I was wondering if you could just say more to affordability, access to health care, especially in the ways that it affects uh, people living with disabilities. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I chose each subject in my documentary for a very specific purpose. Um, I didn't exactly know where the story was going to go. Um, we did hour-long interviews, so that little, like, six-minute film you saw was cut down from three hours, four hours of footage. But um, I interviewed Jaleesa because uh, we were both Jersey girls. We've, um, we've been friends for many years and we've done other short films together. And I knew that she was um, having a really hard time getting approved for a prosthetic arm. Uh, I, she had told me many stories about the questions on the paperwork that she had to answer. And, um, you know, she's, she had an amazing prosthetist helping her through the, the process of that paperwork. But it's still, I mean, it's so daunting to, you know, someone like Jaleesa, who is an actress, a creative person, a model, a mother with three, um, three children, a foster mom, and to have, like, piles of paperwork to fill out to get a prosthetic arm, which should be something essential. It's just not something anyone should have to deal with, you know? It's not like she's collecting prosthetic arms for the fun of it. Um, it's a basic human need. Um, and so I knew I wanted to talk to her about her process. And she, she jokes about, you know, the question of, can you brush your teeth? And if you can, well, then you don't need an arm. And it's just ridiculous things like that, that we have to deal with that are like, 
the government asking these questions to us or, well, not always the government, health insurance carriers um, or providers, I should say. Um, so I knew I wanted to talk to her and then I knew I wanted to talk to Denise because um, Denise has also been one of my friends for a while. Uh, she lived with me in Jersey City at one point and um, she moved to Norway and now she doesn't have to crowd crowdsource or crowdfund to get a running leg. Um, she can just get it, you know, um, and it's really incredible. I love what she says about taking a prosthetic leg all the way to the end when it's broken and torn up and in pieces and you can barely walk with it because that's the American way. That's what we do. We take it to the end because we don't know when we'll get another foot, basically. Um, and hearing her talk about the difference in Norway where, you know, she's nervous to see her prosthetist and then she gets to his office and he says, you know, we, the Norwegian community believes these things should be provided for you. So that's that. Um, that was really powerful for me to hear because, you know, as people with disabilities, a lot of times we start to wonder, like, am I worthy of this? Do I deserve to have this? And we're talking about things like prosthetic legs, prosthetic arms, wheelchairs that will just help us live, you know? Like sometimes they are, well, they're always life changing, but a lot of times they're also life saving. Um, so I think that just hearing her say that in Norway, it's like, this is for you. This is what you need. So we are, we are giving this to you without questioning you and without making you fill out stacks and stacks of paperwork. Um, and then I also wanted to interview Andrea because uh, she is a nurse who uses a wheelchair. And I mean, she's not the first nurse who uses a wheelchair, but there are so few. And so I wanted to hear her perspective as both someone with a disability and someone in the medical community. And to hear her say that insurance has not uh, covered a wheelchair for her in over seven years just shocked me. Because even though I'm someone with a disability who knows how hard it is to get a prosthetic leg, it's actually cheaper to make a wheelchair than a prosthetic leg, which is also strange. So I was shocked that she also had such a hard time getting what she needed. Um, so I think the combination of those three interviews really showed how dire the situation is and how much better we deserve. Um, and I, I do, I want to keep sharing it and keep, um, you know, sharing it with policymakers because I recently went to um, the New York State uh, website for um, affordable health care, uh, and I, I was looking on the marketplace for different health insurance plans, and they still say one prosthetic limb per lifetime. That was deemed illegal in 2015. They still say it. They just added the words, this includes coverage for repairs and replacements. Um, but having that language, one limb per lifetime, makes it so hard to get a new prosthesis. Um, and I, could, I, I couldn't believe it because I wanted to move to New York in 2015. And then I saw that and I was like, great, I'll stay in New Jersey. And then you know, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe I want to move upstate, you know, into the woods. And I check again in 2020, and it's still there. And I was like, you know, no wonder my friends in New York have a hard time getting a prosthesis. Because, like, I, I thought, I very stupidly thought that maybe they just had really bad health insurance. But it's not that. It's the one limb per lifetime language. So it's, it's really concerning that it hasn't changed in the past five years. And I'm just hoping that with more awareness, um, 
there can be a greater change. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I saw I got a message. Oh, we only have five minutes left. Um, so if there are any other questions, feel free to unmute and ask. Um, I got a comment from David about, you know, healthcare in the documentary would be something worth getting voices heard and yeah, totally agree. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just step in real quick to say, I think one of the most telling moments in the, in the movie is your shrug <laughs> at the check that you got because it reflects the indifference of the people who are sending that to you. Um, and so what basically I want to say thank you for, for making this because it forces people not to do that. That no one else is allowed to shrug their shoulders anymore. That, that we, are, we are full citizens and we are not going away. And I, I say that to Jennifer, if she's still there, um, thank you for doing what you do, truly. And I hope you keep it up. Thank you so much um, for your time. We hopefully you again you will join the rest of the festival. And again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, all of Thanks. you. Talk to you soon. <laughs>